We are in uh, Proverbs 31. It looks like I've done a pretty good job last time. I've run all the men out of here. Uh, I actually had three men from this class last week that pulled me aside and said, gosh, I'm so glad my wife wasn't here. <laughs> I'll let you in on a little secret. My wife, uh, she was listening from uh, the Zoom broadcast or the streaming broadcast. I, I don't know technology, but... Um, and she, was, she had been looking forward to this section of Scripture. And uh, so that's nothing like having a heat lamp put on your forehead. Uh, and she heard Warren's prayer, and then it went blank. And uh, she spoke to me about her frustration. And I tell you, I said, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness to me uh, every day. Uh, we are in the virtuous woman, Proverbs 31. Uh, we'll begin with verse 10 because we didn't really get through verse 10. Uh, and as we pointed out last time, this is an acrostic, so it's a a device to help one memorize uh, this particular text, and it teaches us that there is a, a great deal of forethought, forethought uh, that this particular section of Scripture was well thought through, calf, uh, crafted carefully by a pen and by a wise and thoughtful servant. So here we begin 31.10 this morning uh, with verse 10, which is our uh, English A. A valiant wife, you may have noble, you have any number of, uh, of names that are uh, addressed to that. A valiant wife who can find her prize is far above corals, Jewels, gold, that's the idea. Very, very precious and valuable. Uh, B, verse 11, the heart of her husband trusts in her. He does not lack spoil. It's a very uh, interesting verse. It, it, we're talking about her value, and then uh, and we're talking about her, the rarity of her and it reflects upon her husband and upon his uh, material gain. What's that all about? Well, that's my job. Uh, here's verse 12, C. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. Verse 13 is our D. With her palms, I'm sure you have hands, but it's actually the word palms. She selects diligently wool and flax. H is verse 14. She becomes like a trading vessel. She brings her food from afar. And verse 15 is the equivalent to our V or W. And she arises while it is still in the night and provides for her household the quota, or you may have uh, portions, to her servant girls. Verse 16 is uh, the equivalent of the Hebrew Z. Uh, she considers a field and purchases it from the fruit of her palms, hands. She plants a vineyard. Verse 17, an H, she girds her loins with strength. And this almost seems redundant, but this is actually how the text reads. She girds her loins with strength. She strengthens, same word, her arms for the task. So that's up to 17, and we'll try to get through that material uh, 
this morning. So I have to ask you men, how'd you do this past week? You know, the little things that we talked about. It's the little things. Um, I, I told you about Martin Lloyd-Jones taking a motor car, he said, to a great distance to preach at a church after he had, uh, had finished uh, ministering in his career at Westminster. So he did a lot of itinerant teaching and he came to a place and the church had set him up with a very elegant house, very wealthy man, and the next morning after breakfast, he was noticing the china cabinet and the proprietor said, I, do you have an interest in those plates and saucers and cups? He said, well, yes, I do. I've never seen anything quite like them. Well, he sat down and the man got out his gloves and he unlocked the case and he pulled out pieces of Swazi china. Very, very valuable. Why? Because Swazi china had only been manufactured for three years in Great Britain and the com company went bankrupt. They uh, couldn't create a market for something so expensive. From 1815 to 1818 and this man owned several pieces of this fine china. That is this word rare. That is this word valuable. So my question to you gentlemen is what gloves did you put on this week to handle your fine china, your very valuable wife? I have a confession to make. I'm so glad she's not listening. Um, my wife drinks zero Coke. I get tired of bringing home zero Coke. And I said to her, in a very humble voice, of course, I don't want to be guilty of putting you to death early by buying you zero Cokes. You're on your own. This week, I was filling up her car, and she said to me, 7-Eleven has a deal on zero Coke. Would you mind picking me up three bottles for $3.75? I, and then I thought of this lesson. Of course, sweetheart. I'm putting my gloves on. I'm handling my fine china, my valuable wife. Yes, of course I will. What else can I do for you? Uh, so I am a man that is eating his own cooking as I read this text this morning. The valiant wife who can find her value more than expensive jewels. And we, uh, we talked about that word valiant, noble. It actually means strength, and it was found for us in Psalm 84 and verse 5. And it's used in 2 Kings chapter 24 and verse 14 for a specific class of people. The people that were strong and considered by Nebuchadnezzar when he swept the southern kingdom away to be very valuable. And so this word was used, the strong, the important. Not people like me that would have been left behind after he ravaged the southern kingdom. That's this word. She's rare. She's valuable. And rather than being praised for her beauty, which this is a society that is cultish about beauty. It's all about beauty. 
The only thing that's mentioned about beauty in this entire text from the Word of God is how fleeting it is. Not permanent. It's here and gone. We see a man pitch a perfect game in the World Series. Don Larson, 1956. Aren't we to expect that from him next time? No. It's, it's such a challenge for the individual to be able to do that on his own. This woman is noted in Holy Scripture for her strength, both in what she produces and her character, what she is. That's what the Word of God calls valuable. And we need to take it to heart. Women, uh, men, young men, should look for her. So, fathers, grandfathers, what are you doing to train the young men in your family how to look for her? Well, you start off with a basic question. How would you look for her? Well, you go look for her at the places that the great, strong, and noble women are. That's not at the bar at the razzle-dazzle. That is in a Christian fellowship, in a Bible study. A believer's chapel. Imagine that. This past week, I noticed a national story. Brock Purdy, the former quarterback of Iowa State that menaced everybody in that conference, is now the starting quarterback of the San Francisco 49ers. And this past week, he announced his engagement to his girlfriend, Jenna Brandt, and it had the photos, he had the photographer all lined up for this big surprise in which he dropped to his knee at St. Cloud, Florida. And he wrote this, My Jenna girl forever can't wait to be your husband and grow together in Christ. Very powerful testimony, but in reality, ladies, the most experienced woman that your son, your grandson has is you. You're the one that can teach him about women. After all, you have direct access to him. So I ask you, ladies, what are you doing to train your children, your grandchildren, about the kind of woman to look for? The men need to know where to find her, and the women teach the men, the young men, the things to look for about them. As I said, young men want to look for her. Older women desire to be like her. My wife has been a Bible study fellowship leader, I think, for 27, maybe 28 years. Uh, I never got my brain around how important her job was until I stopped working and uh, on a daily basis and was at home and saw this tremendous schedule that she runs. And then the coup de grace to it all is somebody took pictures of her class from the balcony in the back of the largest church in Edmond, Oklahoma. It seats 850 people. She had 700 women there. I was awestruck. Couldn't believe it. Now, about 15 years ago, she came home after being in a seminar for several days, and she had to tell me about meeting her new hero in life. Her name was Rosemary Jensen. Rosemary Jensen had committed her life to Christ as a young girl and desired to go to the mission field. And so she took up nursing 
and training. Along the way, she meets a doctor who is also committed to going to the mission field, and they married. And together, in the mid-50s, 1950s, she took a boat with her husband to Africa. It wasn't long before she had two daughters. And here, she says, she learned to pray with agony. She didn't want her daughters to have to leave at a certain age on the mission field to go get an education. She agonized over it. Lord, let me keep these girls. How would God answer that prayer? The very year that she was to send them off, the military base of the United States announced they're starting an elementary school. Imagine that. She learned. The virtuous woman learned. If you analyze her life, it's in concentric circles like a target. The black center of the target was her husband and her family. And as you listen to her, or as my wife explained it to me, uh, as she was faithful in the target itself, God gave her another circle and another and another over a period of time. My wife said, the thing that was fascinating about it all is that when she was lecturing to us ladies, she didn't do what I had seen done a dozen times before, creating a priority list. It starts here at the top, God, your husband, your children. She didn't do that. What she did was draw a circle. And the center of the circle was your relationship with the Lord. That is the center. That needs to be guarded, protected more than anything else. Because you see, then she puts the arrows out from that. That affects how I treat my husband. That affects how I raise my daughters. That affects all the things that I'm involved in doing for the Lord. The sinner has to be protected above all things. Well, needless to say, my wife came back. She was on cloud nine. She had met and actually had lunch in a very large table with 10 other women with Rosemary Jensen. Rosemary Jensen eventually came off the mission field in Africa, got back to the United States, and in the providence of God, she met Ethereal Johnson. Ethereal Johnson had been a prisoner of war in World War II. She was in very poor health, and she convalesced in San Francisco. And a group of women approached her. Will you teach us the scriptures, they asked. And of course, being the obedient servant that she was, she said, no. I don't want to have anything to do with you. Why, they said. They pressed her. Week after week, they pressed her. Finally, she said, okay, we'll do this under one condition. I'll write the notes and you're going to take the notes and you're going to be responsible to come. This is not once and then see you in six months. No, you're going to be required to be attendant. And that is the formation of Bible study fellowship. And imagine of all places in all the world that it began, San Francisco, California. Well, I imagine that Ethereal Johnson and Rosemary Jensen locked in service and fellowship because they both had been missionaries. And it wasn't long before Rosemary Jensen was handed the keys to Bible study fellowship in San Francisco. In the providence of God, somebody had given 
Bible study fellowship a large piece of property outside of San Antonio. It was so far outside the city limits that the utilities had, were not even reaching anywhere near the property. In order to build that into a campus for training, for Bible study fellowship, they had to have water. That was the first priority. So they brought a company in and they did scientific tests by drilling some holes and contouring everything. And here we go. Here's the water well. First hole, dry. Second hole, dry. Third hole, dry. Rosemary said, you need to leave. Here's what I need to do. I need to walk this property. And I need to pray. And I need to spend one day talking to the Lord. And that's what she did. And at sunset, she comes in and announces that the Lord had showed her the place. Well, that didn't fit the contours of the map at all. The professionals knew much better, but they did drill the hole right there, and they found water. Now, don't ask me to explain that. I can't explain that. There's nothing about that that I understand. I believe it. And here's what I also believe. <laughs> one woman, one woman who trusts God and who holds on to the center of that wheel, that personal relationship that she has with Jesus Christ, and that's her top priority. And God honors the target, and He expands to the next circle, and the next circle, and the next circle. You see, back when Rosemary Jensen got Bible Study Fellowship, here's how women went to Bible study. They had little pillbox hats and little fishnets over their eyes. They had high heels and everybody was dressed in dark. They wore white gloves to their wrist or longer. That's just the way it was. Rosemary Jensen brought them into the new century. Women started wearing pants. It was the call to the soccer moms that drive the recreation vehicles, that have busy schedules, putting their children in and out of various and sundry games after school and during the weekends. Don't I know? We did it all. But she transformed Bible Study Fellowship from a small to a large class in San Francisco, moving it to San Antonio, Texas, and it became Bible Study Fellowship International all over the world. That's what God can do with a simple woman who trusts Him, who believes in Him, who listens to Him, and who agonizes in prayer for the things that she knows that God wants most. Ladies, it's hard to make a living in America. It's very difficult. We have inflation. We have an increase in taxes. Always have an increase in taxes. These men that you're joined to work incredibly hard, long hours. I remember, I really look back on it, I was out of the will of God for my company when I actually merged it in 1989. I was working seven days a week. 
My wife was worried about me, and God rescued me by merging the company. Your husbands work hard. They are diligent, and it takes hours to be productive. And your schedule is loaded, but here is the key. You have the time and the energy and the focus to do the really big things like pray. Pray, pray, pray. What God can do with one single woman that trusts Him and pray. That's why our text says she's priceless, which fits Proverbs 23, 23. Buy the truth. Don't sell it. Buy wisdom. Buy instruction. Buy understanding. Jewels. Rubies. Very precious. Her energy for her family, her abilities, her know-how is all laid out here for us. And she is a blessing. I attended Dot Lawson's service yesterday afternoon. And the thing that came very clear in spectacular focus as her family gathered together to rise up and call her blessed is her constant energy and service both to them, that's the first bullseye, and then the next circle to the people that are close friends and the next circle to the church and all she was acquainted with. She left a blazing trail for a road model for anyone. Verse 11, this acrostic B, the heart of her husband trusts in her. He does not lack spoils. You may have the word gain. It's a very common word in the Old Testament. It refers to plunder, to booty, to spoil. Here's the word. It's found in Psalm 119 and verse 62. I think the clearest reading is from the New American Standard. I rejoice at your word like one who finds great plunder. There's the word. So think of it this way. It's just an ordinary afternoon for you, and you get a call from an attorney that you had never heard of, but you listen to the legal ease of the Bradford Bearton Bobble Law Firm, downtown Dallas, Texas. Okay? Uh, we would like for you to come down and sign some papers. It turns out we have been looking for you for a long time. And, sir, you are the only heir of a baron in Europe that we have been able to find. And now you come down, sign all of this information in our boardroom, and you are going to walk out a very wealthy man. That's this word. That's what she is. She is like treasure, like great spoil, great plunder. How in the world did you get her? Isn't that what we always say? My goodness, the things that she is able to do. Here is how she is prized, according to the proverb. She's prized like the very Word of God. Notice her, the heart of her husband trusts in her. That word trust is a familiar word that we've looked at many times in the book of Proverbs. It's a very familiar word, as you can imagine, in all the Old Testament. It means reliable. Now, I drive down from Oklahoma City, and I drive back from Dallas to Oklahoma City. And every week, week in and out, I have to cross the Red River. 
It's about a quarter of a mile. I don't drive, park my car, get my flashlight out, look underneath the bridge. I wouldn't even know what I'm looking for. And wonder, is this reliable to hold my car? I don't do that at all. I trust the bridge. That's this word. It is reliable. It is consistent. That is what she brings to her husband. She's consistent for him as the Scriptures refresh a man's soul, so she refreshes him. And why does her life display that constant pattern of such reliability? Well, look at verse 30. Here's your purpose clause, because she fears the Lord. Now, we have been teaching Proverbs since 2016, believe it or not. And we have looked at that word over and over, the fear of the Lord, that phrase. What is it? Essentially, if you read all the material, up and down, in and out, this thought, that thought, this writer, that writer, looking at it from every angle, to fear the Lord simply means your relationship to Him. It is the equivalent of the New Testament walking by faith, walking in the Spirit, as Paul would put it to us in the book of Galatians. That is living in the fear of the Lord. John Reed was a professor of homiletics at Dallas Theological Seminary. And John Reed preached in that auditorium back in the 70s, or perhaps early 80s. And here was his text, James chapter 5 and verse 16. He preached the big idea of the text. That's the way we were taught to preach, the big idea. And here was his big idea. The effective, fervent prayer of the righteous gets a lot done. That was his big idea. What does James say to us in the New Testament equivalent of oftentimes the book of Proverbs? It's James chapter 4 and verse 2. You have not because you ask not. Look at the invitation that the Scriptures afford us. The welcome mat. The double doors that swing wide open from the Lord to us. Here it is. Matthew chapter 7. 7 and 8. Ask, it'll be given to you. Seek, you'll find. Knock, the door will be open to you. And everyone that asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be open. What we want to do as prayer warriors is make sure that the desires of our heart match exactly what we know to be the desires of our great God. And so we pray on that basis, all in accordance with His will. And sometimes He says yes immediately. Sometimes He says no. And sometimes he says, wait. That's normally the case. We're always waiting, aren't we? Well, wait. Trust him. He works over time. That is his wise way with us. The result of this woman's reliability, notice the text, her husband has no lack, meaning emptiness. She satisfies him completely. And why wouldn't she? We talked about it last time. The sovereignty of God. Do you believe in the sovereignty of God? You can't hang around Believer's Chapel much without learning the sovereignty of God. And what was the sovereignty of God in the garden? That the Lord God Himself brought the woman to the man. And what did He say? 
She matches me perfectly. That's the idea. God has sovereignly put you together. And you say, well, I had a lousy husband. I've got a lousy husband. I've got an unbelieving husband. I've had a very difficult marriage. What should you do? Run? Run away? No. You remain in the condition that you're in, said the Apostle Paul. Stay and pray. Stay and pray. Stay and pray. God is at work in you, for you, by you, through you. All things are working according to His good and perfect will for your life. She is the one who satisfies Him completely. And notice how this is summarized in verse 12. That's the letter G. She does Him good and not evil all. That's the most important word in the entire proverb. All the days of her life. The extent, the duration that she brings to every area of his life. Because she's guarded the sinner. The sinner of the wheel. Her relationship with the Lord. That relationship makes her powerful even over an unbelieving husband. And when this person is gone, they're going to be missed. There's going to be a void. Look at the common word often used in the Old Testament. Good. That's what she brings. She brings value in every situation and occasion and not evil. I had a ministry to a guy out of town. He is in another city in Texas. And it was going along well. A very, very bright guy in the sciences. And he's moved right up in his company. And uh, with one promotion after another and one success after another, he decided that he needed to streamline himself, so he turned over the, all the finances of the household to his wife. All of them. She wrote the checks. She kept up the balances. He was often out of town, would come back, and the deposits would be there. Then came the day that the IRS was at the front door with a letter. You owe all this money to the government plus interest to the government. How could this be? He confronted his wife. She had gotten addicted to Oxycontin and all of that money was gone. Needless to say, he was very angry. I'm going to divorce you, he said. That's when I heard from her, would you please pray? I have repented of what I have done. I have not done my husband good. I have done, look at your text, evil. I have done evil. Would you talk to him? Of course I would talk to him. But he's going to have to call me. I'm not an ambulance chaser. I don't get pry into your private affairs. He's going to have to call me. He never did. They are still married. She asked me to pray. I have prayed. I continue to pray. Look at line 2 here, verse 12. That's the all, that's the most important word in the proverb. Commonly used in the Old Testament for summaries. 
for some reason, her days, her life, constantly making herself a blessing to her husband, to her family, as the circles go wider and wider and wider. Verse 13, now beginning here, we are provided with an itemized deeds that more particularly define the term valiant from her husband to her household to the community. Rosemary Jensen had to have immediate retirement at age 70. Those were the bylaws that they set up of BSF International. So what would she do? Go to Palm Springs? Play golf for the rest of her days? No. She and her husband, keeping their earlier commitment, went back to Africa for him to work as a doctor, she a nurse, and in the providence of God, they came up with an idea. We're going to start an orphanage. There are too many children that have, families have been ravaged by disease in this benighted land, and we're going to start an orphanage. And that's what they did. And they named it Rafiki. The name Rafiki means friend. Rosemary Jensen lost her husband five, six years ago, on to be with the Lord. And she, in her early 90s, has retired from being the director of Rafiki. And so what does she do today? Well, she leads a Bible study once a week from her small house and the women gather around her bed as she continues to teach them the Word of God. What an amazing life. What a valiant woman. Verse 13, here are her palms. Look at her palms. They are diligently working, specifically highlighted by in the creation of a cottage in industry, she selects diligently wool and flax. Diligently. Same word as Proverbs 11.27. Whoever diligently seeks good finds favor. Favor from above. That's what the Lord does for you. Wool. Not purchased at Costco. No. Notice the plural. See, this is the fun thing about the details in the text. Notice the plural. The verb to select. It's selects. Why is that important? Because it indicates all the steps in the process. Wool had to be gathered. It had to be measured. It had to be dried. It had to be made ready for sewing then weighed, then combed, then washed. Washing raw materials would remove any debris, dirt. Fibers were pulled by blunt hooks. Flax was put, put and pulled by the root and placed on the, the roof of the house to dry out. And in all of her labor, Look at line two. In all of that, what is her attitude? Glad. Happy. Glad and happy. That's the Lord in His power to renew your spirit daily because you guarded the hub, the middle, your relationship to Him. That makes a powerful woman. And aren't we blessed when they come across our path? Industrious, intelligent, upbeat. The virtuous woman. Let me close 
by showing you right here what the Scriptures are teaching us. If you will develop a proficiency, I don't care how old you are, young, middle-aged, elderly, it makes no difference. If you will develop a proficiency, God will bring the game to you. You don't have to go look for it. It will come to you. That's what He does. That's this woman's life. But in order to do that, you must wait for Him and guard that sinner above everything else. Because that sinner reflects all of the different aspects of your life. Now, here is the waiting. Joseph could interpret dreams. He had dreams, and he could <clears throat> interpret dreams. He had that gift all of his life. Till that came that day when Pharaoh called him in. And here's the opening lines right there in Genesis from Pharaoh's throne room. I have heard it said to me that you can interpret dreams. I had a dream. I want you to tell me. Now, Joseph could have said, dreams? Dreams? Look, Pharaoh, I've had it up to here with dreams. All my life I've I've been able to interpret dreams. All my life I have seen dreams. And every time I have in my life, it has brought heartbreak, heartache, division in my family. It has left me in your prison as an innocent man left to die and rot. No, sir, I'm out of dreams. No dreams for me. But he didn't do that, did he? He said... Don't dreams come from God? Tell me your dream. I'll interpret your dream. He waited upon the Lord. He trusted in the Lord. And he stayed at it. At it. And what did God do? He changed the history of the world. Because he didn't give up. And he didn't get exhausted. And he didn't remain anxious. Ladies, you yourselves alone have enormous power. Trust the living God. Live for Him. Guard the sinner. And we will look back just like we did yesterday with Dot Lawson and say, what an amazing life. Look at all she did. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for our time of study this morning. May the power of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit imbue these women here today with great strength that comes from above and use them mightily for Your service to us men, husbands, friends, people at church, however You choose to use them to change our lives for the better. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.